And now, as they say, without further ado, I will ask Janneke Patrick, there she is, Janneke Patrick, to introduce this year's Selma Jean Cohen Dance Lecturer. Janneke. I have the great honor to introduce Janaki Nair, my colleague in dance, who won the Selma Jean Cohen Dance Lecture Award. Selma Jean Cohen was a very great lady in making people understand that when they say dance embodies culture, they're talking about a dance which some define as ephemeral, yes, trivial, no. She made us understand, not only in her monumental 10-year project of the Dance Encyclopedia of the World, the World Dance Encyclopedia, but in her groundbreaking book, Dance as a Theater Art, that it is a very important art reflecting the uniqueness and the unifying nature of dance. And people bandy about the word embody, an embodied dance embodies culture. She showed why it is a theater art. It is a very great art. She endowed this lecture because her experience in uh, a, a Fulbright um, award year <clears throat> was so important to her and we're very grateful this recognition uh, that dance writing also is a great art to try to describe physical movement in words. Janaki Nair, the winner this year, combines all of that intercultural and all, she is <clears throat> trained first and foremost since the age of five by her Katakali guru, uh, Sri Nelly, uh, Neliyadu Vasudevan Nambutari. Then she also is a very eminent academic with an MA in media and an, I'm an MFA, a Master of Fine Arts in Dance, and a PhD. She has explored the concept of embodying the dance because her art is Katakali, which is traditionally all male, and yet she is female. And she has explored and articulated what are the processes through which you create character. Our names are both Janaki, but it goes much beyond that. I have studied classical Indian dance for 55 years, and my style is Katak. Janaki Nair's style is Katakali. So what's common in there, Kata, Kata, story? How do you tell stories? You have to create characters which people believe they see in their imagination and you embody before them the different characters. Hers, in my style, we embody all the characters in a story. In Janaki's style, she embodies one character and there's a whole, uh, there's a whole team of other actors embodying the other characters. But she is one of the few women who embodies male characters, and she is going to talk about that. And if you are interested, she will let you experience a few of the ways that a Katakali artist, and particularly a female, a rare female Katakali artist, who embodies male characters. Her studies have been in the she calls it psychophysical training. 
That means both the mind and the body have to combine in such a way that you create a believable reality, but not, but not something that you see before your eyes, which is not the thing itself, and yet you believe and are moved by it. So now Janaki Nair will tell you about being a female Katakali artist, embodying male characters and that process. Janaki Nair, it's my great pleasure to introduce you. Thank you all. Thank you, Janaki Patrick, for such a lovely introduction. And you said um, such important points, and thank you so much for your time. And thank you, of course, to Fulbright Association for having me here. It's such an honor to stand here and talk to you all. Once again, thank you to each one of you who are present here to listen to me. And I hope to take you um, into my journey of Kathagali today. So first of all, by way of an introduction, I want to draw your attention to the way my journey into Kathakali as a performer also evolved as an investigation into Kathakali practice to better understand the nature of my, my own performative experiences using the game-changing frame of practice-based research. As a Kathakali practitioner, I have one big question about the Kathakali experience. What happens to me when I take on the extraordinary character of a mythic being or god during a performance? I'm one of the few female Kathakali performers in India who has been trained to perform male characters. The five-foot frame of my body suggested that this transformation is a considerable feat. However, my guru, Sri Neliyod Vasudevan Nambudri, was always confident that the traditional Kathakali training system cultivate remarkable performative achievements. From my age of five, my guru was able to teach me how to use my small physique to carry out mythical masculine movements. From the beginning of my training, the aim was to make everything I did and thought a matter of second nature. I later wondered what mental activities were involved as these transformations became part of my professional life as a performer. In my journey into this art form, this wondering became a matter of reflection and analysis. I began to ask how a South Indian woman like myself becomes somebody who is so very other. What is involved in this particular modality of performance, and how do I articulate the subjective experience of actualizing this transformation? I will try and answer some of these questions today by taking you through traditional Kathakali training systems and pract performance practices. However, it is, it's a really vast subject that I'm trying to counter in, in today's talk, and I feel I'm getting a bit ambitious trying to answer all these questions. Um, but I will try my best um, to make you understand how the process actually work in terms of embodying characters. Before I go any further, I would love, like to quickly give a brief introduction about Kathakali. Kathakali dance drama developed during the 16th and 17th centuries in the Malayalam-speaking coastal region of Southwest India, known today as Kerala. It is a distinctive genre of South Asian performance that utilizes unique dancing and acting techniques. The word Kathakali literally means story play. Katha means story and play and Kali means play. So Kathakali means story play. It is believed that these story plays originated in an earlier dance form of dance 
theatre called Krishnanatam. The historian Kunyunni Raja has described how the Raja of the town of Kottarakara requested a Krishnanatam troupe to perform but was turned down and so decided to invent a version of this art form for himself, more or less using the same model of Krishnanatam. He termed the new art form as Ramanatam as the first eight stories were based on the life of Lord Rama. However, when other writers and poets began to create stories from other sacred books such as uh, Mahabharata or Bhagavata, the name Ramanatam was no longer an appropriate name. Thus, its name was changed to Kathakali to broadly appropriate the inclusion of different stories. The earliest versions of Ramanatam mixed pure dance aspect, which is the nritta aspect, um, with spoken element, which is the vachika apinaya. But as the art form developed, this latter element was removed and the performer's body became the central tenet or the vehicle for conveying the stories. And after this, many other creative additions were made by different other Kathakali exponents, including the celebrated performer Vellatha Chathapanikar, who restructured and stylized the bodily movements using his experience of Kalari Payata, a martial art form of Kerala. So you can imagine the extent of challenging movements Kathakali would comprise of. Now, having briefly mentioned about the history of Kathakali, I would now like to play a short video of Kathakali performance for my listeners to get a visual experience of this art form.
that was a short edited version of a long performance so it might not have made much sense actually in terms of what story they are playing but that's because it's a 3 hour long performance edited to a 3 minute video actually so <laughs> so um um so as my colleague Janaki Patrick mentioned before, female presence is not so common um, in this art form. It could be perhaps due to such voluminous costume, heavy costume that the performers need to carry on stage and stay there for three hours, four hours long performance. Could be because of that or perhaps due to social bias, perception towards women or because of the challenging masculine movements. Um, and in this art form, due to rarity of female Kathakali artists, mostly male performers do female characters as well. So this practice of transvestism has been a common feature in Kathakali dance. However, we must give consideration to those few women Kathakali exponents, such as um, Chavara Parakuti Amma, Kaipanjeri Kunyamalu Amma, to name a few who ventured out to this male-dominated art form. The only female Kathakali troupe, although was welcomed as an alternative to mainstream Kathakali troupe in Kerala, is hardly considered equal to male counterparts. Kerala Kalamandalam, the Kathakali school in Kerala, was not admitting female students to Kathakali training until recently where they made a welcoming revolutionary decision to start accepting female students from last year. So after 90 years of training Kathakali, they made that decision last year to admit female students. Thus, until last year, those women, including me, who were interested to learn Kathakali had to undergo private training. This means women were not able to access a systematic training in Kathakali and the quality of the training that we get and the elements that we get through the training depends on the teacher that we each one of us get. Such patriarchal approaches to the presence of women in Kathakali are implicitly recognized but explicitly ignored. Luckily, I had a wonderful guru, Sri Nelliyodu Vasudevan Nambudri, who affectionately taught me Kathakali without any gender bias, and hence I am standing in front of you today to talk about this male character embodying. The, one of the common practices I have seen is those female students who are interested to learn Kathakali, when they go to a private teacher, they will be taught to uh, embody female characters with the prejudice that they won't, females will not, will not be able to do male characters because of challenging movements and heavy costumes. So they get sidelined um, to female characters from the very beginning itself. They won't even get, be given a chance to learn male characters. But as I said, mentioned before, I was lucky enough to get training through my guru, Sri Nelliyodavas Devan Nambudri. Now, having given a background about Kathakali and situated the issue of womanlessness in Kathakali, I would now like to go back to my questions. What does it mean to embody a character in Kathakali? How do female Kathakali performers prepare their body and mind and allow themselves to become male characters? What is the methodology or performance modality of Kathakali and how can we articulate the embodied experience of a dancer? To answer this, it becomes imperative to look into the confederate factor of Kathakali training and how a novice is trained psychophysically to embody a character. So to begin with, I'm recalling Sage Bharata's concept of Loka Dharmi and Natya Dharmi from the time-honored repository of Indian performance studies, Natya Shastra. In chapter 14 of this text, Natya Shastra, Bharata introduces two modes of dharmis or acting, which are Loka Dharmi and Natya Dharmi. Loka literally means worldly, and Loka Dharmi means that which concerns to the worldly style of acting. Natya Dharmi, in contrast to Loka Dharmi, refers to forms of theatre that employ highly stylized gestures to create artistic effects. For example, one of the common examples that I always use in my talk is that if I am to walk 
from one point to another as if I do in my daily life, then that is loka dharmi kind of acting. Whereas if I walk from the same point to the other point using stylized movements, then that is natya dharmi kind of acting. In Kathakali, Natya Dharmi's style of acting is the central tenet. Each and every element of Kathakali theatre is in Natya Dharmic form. You cannot see anything that which is daily in this art form. Everything is extra daily. This term, extra daily, is coined by Italian theatre director Eugenio Baba, and he developed his influential distinction between the daily and extra daily in theater studies based on Sage Bharata's concept of Loka Dharmi and Nati Dharmi. And as the theater theorist Richard Scherner pointed out, Kathakali theater is an example of codified system of acting. For me, my journey into this divine art form was special and at the same time challenging. Questions were unsettled in my mind as to how I am going to make people believe that I am male while I bury my female identity inside this voluminous Kathagali costume. As I mentioned before, I will look into this through the training that I underwent and in, especially in two sections, preparing outer body, which will be the first section that uh, we will be looking into, and then preparing inner body as I ter term it, which is the mind of the performer. This art form is based on a strict regime of practice. Kathakali artists have to learn from practice and find their way through practice to refine the techniques. The traditional training system has three main sections and it starts with an oil massage. This is called Chavitti Urichil. To, in, to facilitate increased muscular flexibility and strength. However, this phase or the Chavati Urichal is not given for female students considering their natural body flexibility. The training then proceeds, so without getting the first phase of training, we female um, students will have to proceed to the second phase where we will start to get um, taught with a sequence of strict and rigorous exercises such as Mayura Padava, Churipa, etc. One of these exercises known as Churipa is an important way of developing balanced body movements and includes the circular motioning of hands. I'll play a video of uh, my Kathakali class where my and my friend is practicing Churipa, uh, the, the preliminary exercises. These are all different sorts of exercises that we get introduced to at the first stage of training. So in this way, each upanga or body parts, such as eyes, fingers, wrists, facial muscles, are all considered as the most expressive parts of the body and are painstakingly trained to implement highly stylized actions, those natya dharmic. So th this is the point where we start to embrace the extra daily movements. From this training stage onwards, I started to notice that my body is starting to experience a transformation from my daily body to Natya Dharmic extra daily body. 
By completing the first section of training, a Kathakali student's body is expected to attain a level of efficacy where he or she can use her body at their command. Now that the body has exemplified the preliminary culture of Kathakali, moving to the second section of training, the student will be prepared to focus on different rhythms and the application of these in the pure dance aspect of Kathakali. This is when one gets trained in Kalashams. Kalashams are the intricate footwork patterns where, um, and that we get trained to uh, move our body in line with the different rhythmic patterns. So I would like to quickly demonstrate one Kalasham here, um, which is usually, which is used um, in male characters. second section will be asked to move our body in line with this rhythms and that is when we'll be uh, taught to uh, taught on how to um, keep our breath and um, and the energy level and all that which about which I will go into in the next section so once this performative body is prepared um, we move to the third part of training which trajects a student to begin learning different characters and set patterns of story. Cholliyattam is the term used for this training, where the student learn how to act or dance in conjunction with the percussion and his prepared performative physical body. Cholliyattam systematically prepare a student as it is the first step towards embodying a character. Through, this, through his acquired knowledge, in hand gestures, kalashams, the footwork, and different facial expressions, the student learned to epitomize a character. I would like to play another video of Cholliyattam in class, where my teacher was training me up to um, a character called Bhima in Kalyana Sauganthikam play. Mariyil ninnu poga vaigate Vanaradama Mariyil ninnu poga vaigate Vanaradama Mariyil ninnu poga vaigate Pogaigil ninne Muruta ko pa mo ta tu tu nyan ninde. Muruta ko pa ta tu tu. 
ಕಾಡುತ್ತು ನಾನಿಂದೆ ಕಾಡುತ್ತಿಲ್ಲಂಬುದು ಪೇಟೆ ಚೂಡನ್ ಕಾಡುತ್ತಿಲ್ಲಂಬುದು ಪೇಟೆ ಚೂಡನ್ ತಾರಚನೆ ತಾರಚನೆ ಎರಿಂಗು ವಾರಿಸು ಓವರೆ ನಾಗುಲ ಈ ವಾರಿಸು ಓವರೆ ನಾಗುಲ ವಾರಿಗಿಲ್ ಇನ್ನು ಪೋಗ ವೈಗಾತೆ ವಾನರಾಧಮ ವಾರಿ ಇನ್ನು ಪೋಗ So this traditional training system is developed to heighten a performer's awareness of her own physical movements. The somatic attention, this, this, this level of somatic attention actually made me realize that the movements in Kathakali are stylized in such a way to portray gender identity of a character through a convergence of different factors as i mentioned before such as energy level breath space and time my ability to perform male characters is also based on the level of attention that i give to these factors as i perform for example prana or vayu this term can be loosely translated to breath or even energy level I remember my teacher constantly using the word vayu as a prompt to remind me to focus on my energy level and breath as I rehearsed a male role in front of him. The use of vayu for a male character is indeed different from female characters. When a woman trains to play a character of the opposite sex, one's breath patterns must take on highly stylized qualities. especially with hand gestures the application of breath can express femininity or masculinity for example um, hand gestures used by male and female characters are similar however the breathing method that we use and the projection of the quantity of energy differ if it is a male characters the mudras or the hand gestures will be strong and vigorous whereas in female characters this will be held delicately or gently the audience actually will be unaware of the gender identity of the performer because of the costume and so these stylizations of your of one's breath and energy level and vayu must be the, must be considered as the key signifiers of characterizations again i would like to demonstrate another kalasham a uh, footwork um first as a female character and then the same movement as a male character saransa netra a short example actually there is quite a lot to actually talk about the breath patterns and um, i realized that that in itself is a, a a different research subject that i must look into at, at some point in my future um so now that we have uh, discussed about 
our outer body. Again, one, two more aspects, sorry. In the same way, Kathakali performs use of space, as you might have seen while I was demonstrating two different um, characters. The use of space around a performer helps to amplify or diminish one's action to suit the gender of the, or of the character that she is playing. So in this way, performativity can be created to suit each character by qualitatively and quantitatively changing the aforementioned factors at work in and around the performer's body. This analysis based on my first-hand experience hopes to highlight the potential of traditional training techniques to generate highly stylized modalities of Kathakali performativity. Preparing mind. So once my body started to embrace the preliminary culture and expectations of Kathakali, I started to think about the role of my mind while embodying male characters. During training sessions, student performers are asked to enhance their imaginative skills by engaging interpretatively with the stories and epics of um, Hindu religion or other Indian stories. This is in fact a matter of responding in depth to the culture from which the art form has been developed. A practitioner's ability to understand the profundity of these narratives is a defining factor in her ability to properly embody a character during a performance. On a general level, understanding the cultural context of Kathakali theater is a prerequisite for commencing one's training. As Ananda Kumaraswamy pointed out, to understand an art form fully, one should understand the culture from where that particular art form has stemmed. Richard Scherner's view in, is also similar. He thinks that a dance technique requires that the dancer identifies herself with that technique's culture. This points out that the process of embodying is generated outwards from the inner mental world of the performer. We will closely look into this through an example. There are sections in Kathakali performance called Ilagiyatam. This is where the lyrics are completely nullified and the actor is given space to improvise. At this stage, an actor augments his imagination in conjunction with the stories that he read and will extend the scene by explaining the related stories through the actor's lens. Artem demands an actor to develop his knowledge about Indian epics and stories. Therefore, it becomes imperative for an actor to prepare him internally by invigorating his understanding and appreciation about the different aspects of Kathakali stories. These, uh, these Ilagi Atam segments are unstructured interpolations in which two or three characters create a dialogue using hand gestures to elaborate a scene. I'll now play a video where characters Bhima and Panjali converse as husband and wife in Kalyana Saugandhikam play. We will watch this Ilagi Atam series where you will see me performing the character of Bhima, the male character, and the Kathakali exponent Kalabharati Vasudevan, a male performer playing the character of Panjali, a female character. Kalabharati Vasudevan and I were not given a set text to perform and so extemporized a scene in which a wife worries about her husband setting off on a journey to the forest. Panjali or Kalabharati Vasudevan, a male performer, as Panjali, expressed her concerns with a sequence of hand gestures. And I responded by representing as Bhima, a heroic character who does not fear anything in his life. I represent these features using hand gestures as main medium of characterization. The reciprocal performance we improvised was only possible because of the movement literacy that we attained through years of training. However, not just the periphery, Without a trained mind, such improvisation sections will get really difficult for an actor to handle. Thus, there is clearly a connection between the mental world of the performer and embodying a character. The dancer's imagination is at work, indeed fully engaged by the bodily execution of movements here. Here both performers, Kalabharati Vasudevan and I, are cross-dressed and 
not only our body executed techniques that reflect our gender identity of the character, but also our minds have imaginatively embarked into the mindset of the opposite sex that we embodied. We'll now watch the video. This performance was in 2015, and I apologize for any issues with the quality of the video. I, I personally don't think that it's a really um, in a good quality video and audio, but I, I thought it would be a good example to put forward.
That was again part of a very long performance cut short to three minutes. Um, and now I'm trying to bring together all the points that, that I mentioned here and trying to conclude. Um, and, um, and here I would like to bring back Eugenio Baba, who identified three different levels of organization where a performer's work fuses into a single profile. The first aspect is related to the inner body or the mind um, discussion here, and Baba calls this aspect as individual. The second aspect is common to all performers, and the third concerns all performers from every era and culture. These aspects are, one, the performer's personality, her sensitivity, artistic intelligence, social persona, or those characteristics which render the individual performer unique and uncopyable. Second, the particularities of the theatrical traditions and the historical cultural context through which the performer's unique personality manifests itself. And the third, the use of the body and mind according to extra daily techniques based on transcultural recurring principles. These principles are defined by Baba as the field of pre-expressivity. He also notes that for a spectator, these levels are inseparable and indistinguishable. All what they see is the totality of one's performance and as a performer's presence, as he terms it. Thus, a performer's technique are not what we see peripherally, but conscious and codified in the act of being performatively present. What matters here is how the mind interacts with the performing body. For a Kathakali performer, an inner body is objectified by combining an actor's understanding, knowledge, imagination, interpretation, and created consciousness. This is the factor which adds uniqueness in each Kathakali actor's approach towards a character. Thus, the mind that a performer carry will no longer be a daily mind but through training, it gets transformed to an extra daily Natyadharmic mind. In fact, when the dailiness lefts over and when the performance begins, a performer gets transported to her extra dailiness. So during a performance, if we consider that the performative body of a practitioner is carrying an extra daily inner body, which is a trained consciousness, and outer body, an extra daily outer body, which she prepared through different training techniques, it is clear that an interplay of these two bodies actualize a performance. Thus, the outer performing body is constantly in dialogue with an internally constructed persona reflected in performance practice. For a female performer to embody a male character, the gestural apparatus that she used to show masculine movements is only one part of the story. The efforts she takes to shape her inner and outer self both complicates and extends her physical presence. I would like to conclude there and would like to open this talk for any questions. Thank you. Hello. Um, you were talking about there's a, there being a lot of gender stereotypes with this art. And I was just wondering, what are some solutions that you can think of to change that? And may I ask another question with that? How many hours a day with practicing and perfecting this art do you do a day uh, when you begin training with this? Is it is it a lot of hours or is it few hours but more days? I was just wondering like the regiment, if that's okay to ask. Thank sure. you. Sure, thank you for that question. Um, I will address your first part of the question, how to, ad um, how to address this issue of gender stereotyping. I think the move has just started, as I mentioned before, after 90 years, Kerala Kalamandalam started admitting students from last year and uh, my part as a 
female performer is to actually do such talks and to do research in Kathakali and to show people that it is possible for a female to perform and, and to research and be active in this field. Um, and, and, uh, and I think a collective movement towards this, which, which has started now and it's very hopeful, um, would address this concern, I think. And um, going to the second part of your question, um, when I started learning this art form, I used to practice three to four hours a day um, and on weekends was my, my Kathakali classes in front of my guru. I used to go and um, learn there in front of him for around five to six hours. So it's kind, I spend a lot of time behind practicing and, and getting trained. However, I still feel that there is quite a lot to get perfected in my body movements, which actually calls for more hours of practice and, and training um, in an ideal world. Um, and which brings me back to um, another point about female body uh, and performing male characters is that my practice hours got really significantly reduced after my after me delivering my son, because yeah. how my body started to respond to such movements. I had a C-section, which was the last thing which I wanted on my body. And um, after all that, my, the way my body responded to such practice sessions and performances was quite different. So I had to significantly reduce the practice hours. And I hope that I can come back after some years. So yeah, it, it differs, but ideally, a lot of practice and a lot of practice hours, yeah, thank you. Hi. Um, I have so many questions, but I have to choose one. And uh, I am uh, an actor and a teacher of voice and speech at Ithaca College. And so your talk about the different breath patterns is just fascinating to me. And um, this is probably a huge question, and I'm asking you to boil it down into something oversimplified, but could you just talk a tiny bit about those different breath patterns? Because I found you doing those same gestures with first a male or first a female breath yeah. pattern and then a male, just mind blowing. Thank you. Um, yes, it's such a fascinating aspect to look into, the breath pattern. Again, while I was going through the training, I wasn't realizing that this is what I'm doing. I was just copying my teacher. But when I started to look into my own practice, I started to understand that this is actually helping me to, um, to portray the gender identity of the character. Um, even the hand gestures. Um, I, can, I can show one small example again. Um, Footwork patterns as well. There are different other breathing patterns that we need to that we need to follow. But that in itself is a research area to yes. look into. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, um, I just wanted to know: uh, is there any difference between mm. Kathakali and Kathak? Because I have seen some performances in Lahore by Maharaj that seemed like a different uh, dance form. Just want to clarify. Yes, yes, of course. It's two different, entirely different dance forms. Um, the similarity is that they both are coming f from India. And of course, the stories uh, that these two performance genres follow and the performative elements are somewhat similar. However, um, Kathak is a North Indian dance form about which, of course, more than me, um, Janaki Patrick would be the right person to answer. And Kathakali is a South Indian uh, theater form uh, which, has, which, which has got a lot of dramatic aspect as well. Uh, and she quite rightly pointed out at the beginning, in Kathak, um, 
the dancer is being a dancer, correct me if I'm wrong as well, uh, is being a dancer and she goes through different characters while she tells that story. So she is not actually characterizing as one particular character while she performs. Whereas in Kathakali, we put that costume for a particular character and then we are that character from the beginning till the end because it's kind of a drama, uh, dance drama. Um, yeah, that's the kind of key difference, but of course there are different other uh, differences with the footwork and all that. I can show the basic stance of Kathakali. Lots of differences at the end. Thank you. I have a, I have a question about um, the percussionists and, and rhythm. So we, Western dance um, uh, follows a sort of syntax of rhythmic patterns uh, in 3 4, or 4 4 time, or something like this. But you're following uh, a rhythmic pattern that I, I can't even discern. Um, I can I can feel the tempo, in in and I'm wondering I'm wondering how the structure is done percussively. Uh, does it change in tempi over time? Do, do different stories have different tempi? Are those guys um, following pa patterns? Are they extemporizing? It's the it's the interaction between the musicians or percussionists and the dancers that I. Appreciate you talking about for a second. Yes, of course, such a lovely question. Thank you for that. Again, a vast um, subject to talk about. Um, Kathakali does have set rhythmic patterns, and we have major, um, importantly, four uh, rhythms, which are called Chemba, Chembada, Adanda, and Muri Adanda. Um, uh, for example, if I go into chem Chembada, it's eight beat pattern. So um, it, for each cycle, there will be eight beat um, cycle. Um, and for Chembada, it is 14. Um, so it differs like that. And it is all set already. And the Kalashams or the footwork or the, what you have heard is actually constructed based on these rhythmic patterns. Say for example, the one, the example which you have seen here is set to Chembada Thalam, is in um, um, eight beat cycle. But you won't, of course, you, you said it quite rightly that it's very difficult to discern the, the eight-beat cycle from it because of the, the way that percussionist um, did that. And it is his improvisation. And, and also, this is um, each percussionist talent as well, how they actually construct it above that basic rhythm. Um, yeah, it, that's how it works. And the, 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 temp, the rhythm does not change for each play. Uh, it is set already for each play. However, the tempo differs depending on the character and or the mood of the scene. If it is a, a very, uh, if it is a scene where a character comes and cries about something or is very sad about something, of course, the same chembada eight beat cycle can be done in a very slow pace, whereas the same chembada can be done in a fast pace to uh, to show the furious nature of a character. So. It's the layers which is built upon that basic structure that makes it sound different. I'd love to see some conversation and jamming between jazz percussionists in the United States <laughs> and, and the percussionists that you work with. It would be... It'll be amazing. Oh, be fantastic. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. In the performance, does the dancer, is there any role for the dancer to interpret or Im improvise on a personal basis, or is it highly regimented, you know, prescribed? Um, we can, of course, as I mentioned before, the Ilagiyatam segments are the ones where we can improvise. But I cannot improvise as Janaki there, because I'm not Janaki anymore in that um, in, on that stage. So I need to improvise as the character. So we, even though Ilagiyatam segments are the parts where we get freedom as an actor, to improvise, if we really look into it deeply, we are not actually getting that much freedom to improvise um, anything that which comes to uh, our mind. And that goes back to the um, translationism practice as well. 
sometimes you know my mind would say uh, quite feminine aspects it, it would just come up with such ideas um, but i have to uh, you know stop it quickly and have to think like a man when i improvise so it's kind of a, a challenging part so it, it's not quite a freedom that we are getting or at the same time we have to be very careful as well what we improvise and that is when we need to know the this other stories as well because the the person standing next to us could be a really good kathakali performer who knows everything about other stories and everything and he can ask questions to me what happens if bhima does this and i should be knowing what actually happened in that story otherwise i would not be able to answer him and such discussions would happen after a kathakali performance when we come back to stage and um senior kathakali artists can say that you answered this actually this is what has happened so you know such corrections and things like and that's how we improve as a uh, actor i hope i answered your question thank you yeah hi um thank you so much for this beautiful presentation and i recognize um it's one thing to be a dancer and help amazing uh, gift that you're giving us by documenting it. Um, and I also very much appreciated the, um, the translation you provided in the last video. Um, now, being an American, I would not have known what those gestures meant. And so I was wondering if the audience in your, in, in your culture in India, would they know without the translation? Um, actually, no. Um, and while I was watching that video, I realized that I could have subtitled it. Um, and that is when I started talking in between that video and tried to um, say this, um, say what it meant. But um, Kathakali, actually it's quite a, um, it, there are certain connoisseurs who literally knows what each performers are showing. Like my grandfather, who's, who's not a Kathakali performer at all, not trained in Kathakali at all, but he can literally say what each gestures mean. Uh, and he would sit right in front of my performance and he will correct me that this is why did you show this you know so there are connoisseurs like that um, and there are other people who would only know the totality of what the play actually means and would try to discern it from certain movements and would not understand the the each and every movements and those connoisseurs who really understand each and every meaning behind movement are they, I, I sometimes even feel that they are like kind of an addicted to the performances because these performances have been repeated for long, long, long years. It's the same story that we are performing, but the improvisation sections is where it changes. And that is where we bring in our own touch to that play. And that is what such connoisseurs, that such, um, you know, um, people who are quite experienced in watching Kathakali knows that this is what Janaki has input it as, as a performer. And is that right or is that wrong? That is where they kind of you know, value me or, or mark me as a performer. So yeah, there are people like that, and, but majority I would say would not understand what is happening. So we are making efforts now to give leaflets about what it means altogether, what that story means. Um, and we try to say the story with so much detail at the beginning as well. So we are making efforts to reach out to all different people but of course you know as i mentioned in my talk it's such a codified system of acting lots of codes are there even the case endings have hand gestures the lyric um, the, for the kathakali lyrics called the artakatha the grammatical structures and case endings also got hand gestures in it so we are actually learning a language um, and it's so amazing. I don't know, I'm taking too much time, I think. It's so amazing that sometimes, it, because of the white beard thing that you might have seen, it um, restricts us from talking. So once this has been um, on our face, we won't be able to talk before this stage. So just before getting onto stage, if we have to say something to our co-actor, we, we usually talk with hand gestures and they will understand, get me some water, I'm so thirsty, or something like that, you know, such, such common sentences, we can talk using hand gestures. Yeah, so it's kind of a developed language, actually, a sign language, perhaps. Thank you. Two more questions, yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, I really enjoyed your presentation, um, especially when you started to dance, and I'm an architect and professor of architecture, and so I started fantasizing about what space could it be where you're actually um, 
dancing in reality. And so I was thinking what are, I could ask, which was your favorite space where you performed? How, how did that um, shape uh, your relationship between you and your audience, uh, your roles? Uh, how did the space help you perform? Such a wonderful question. Thank you so much. And that plays a key role in the mind of a performer, the space that we are doing. Um, the favorite space I would like to perform is um, temples in Kerala, which is actually the, the, the traditional space for Kathakali. And that space gives us a kind of a mindset where we can easily transform to the character. Usually Kathakali performances starts after the main ritual in the temple and the, the ambience um, sound there um, and the, the, the fragrance there in the temple, everything lifts up us up to that character. So that's the, and um, in my thesis, in my um, PhD thesis, I wrote a lot about the space and how it matters the mind of a body. So it's such a lovely question and an important point to bring up as well. Thank you Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll make a quick comment and then a very short question. Uh, when I was in Calcutta, they have all night performances. They do vocal, they do instrumental, and they do dance. It starts at eight in the morning, uh, eight in the evening, and goes more or less till seven or eight in the morning. And there might be 10 or 12 sets of different groups that are performing. Uh, they may have performed this dance type, I, I wouldn't know. Uh, my interest was elsewhere, humanities, history, and so forth. My short question is, when can we watch you perform? And where do we have to go? Is that a ticket to Kerala? <laughs> Oh, good question about which I don't have a, an actual answer now. Um, these Get with the executive director. <laughs> uh, yeah, I would love to perform, actually. I, I was taking it very uh, slowly after my delivery, as I mentioned before, but now I am in, in full swing, I believe. I started to perform back. Last year, I gave a full performance for Milab Fest in the UK, and uh, the video is available um, in YouTube. Um, so, unfortunately, that's the only answer that I can give now. But in, um, if I get another opportunity, of course, I will be letting the Fulbright Association know and maybe, um, yeah, if anyone is interested can come along. Please do. It would be thank an you. honor for thank me. You, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you so much for listening to me. It's been such a wonderful experience for me. Thank you.